Welcome back to Grow, the podcast where we look for the practical steps to help you and I excel in our business. Now, in today's episode, we're going to be focusing on how to generate more sales leads for our businesses. What are the best channels of communications to generate leads for our business? How long does it even take to generate a lead? And how can we tell if a particular sort of lead is worth keeping, worth nurturing, or worth letting go of? These are the things that we're going to get some clarity on in today's episode with our special guest, Andrew Smart. Andrew is the founder and solutions director of Virtual Sales Team. So there's no better person to draw this value from in this particular subject. Father time, it never ever stops. It never ever breathes. It's always moving and it's always evolving. Now to me, that means that as business people and business owners, we can't stand still. We can't stop evolving. We need to keep adapting. But how have things changed over the last decade when it comes to the way businesses generate their leads? I think everyone gets better at what they do over time, but technology has dramatically changed in that time. Um, email, digital, LinkedIn, um, all the different social channels, social media. These are all, all tools that we now use. Um, and you're taking a lot of guesswork into who you're targeting. So we certainly wasn't an agency that did a spray and pray um, where you are taking a phone book out and phoning everybody, which is a bit of an 80s cliche for a double glazing company. We were never that, but you probably started with a database in Excel yeah. and you would work with your client to try and define who they wanted an appointment with or a lead from um, and you'd, you'd get trained on it and we'd, we'd represent our, our customers as, as the client but you've got to call through a list you know, and it's, it's a lot of graft, it's a lot of hard work. What we are now trying to do is put more science into sales, yep. that's one of our um, uh, taglines at the moment and that's all about using data to drive the agenda of every meeting we have, but also every um, campaign that we work on. Um, you want to get smarter every week and every month that you pick up the telephone. So that's understanding what the data is telling you, how, how, how long it's taken to get through to someone, how likely, what the propensity of them is to buy, um, what the opportunity value is that your client is quoting on, how many they actually win from what you've quoted. So actually, I think the, to answer your question is, a, is quite a big, big uh, answer, but digital transformation is the biggest one. Yeah. Now, as a business owner, if we have products to sell or services to provide, we need someone to buy these products and to use these services. But where do we find these people? And how do these people find us? Let's find out what lead generation actually is and how we actually achieve it. Uh, lead generation can be defined uh, in many different ways, but I guess my definition would be um, creating the creation of a sales funnel. Yeah. Um, so it's all of the groundwork, all of the preparation, all of the foundations of trying to sell something, um, you need to start ultimately with a lead. Where are you gonna get your business from? Now a lead could be anything from a very slight inquiry through to a, I'm ready to buy, and there's so much in between of that. And, and you will have different stages of probability of how strong that lead is. So, but ultimately you've gotta start with where do the leads come from? Mm. So to me, Lead generation is the creation, the work, the preparation and how to generate business for your company, your business. Yep. But where are those leads going to come from? Are they going to be um, inbound digital leads? Are they going to be outbound telemarketing leads? Are they going to be advertising in the press? Are they going to be straight off your website? 
Are there going to be referrals? Are they, you know, there's, it's endless, really. Um, the, the, the um, you know, where leads can come from. Yeah. But what you've got to do, and be really clear about, is measure. Yeah. The success of each particular channel, and where those leads are coming from, so you can go back to the point that we were making a, a moment ago is understanding the return on investment. Yeah. So if I've paid five thousand pounds for an advert. Yeah. And I've only got five leads. Yeah. It's a thousand pound a lead. Yeah. If I've, you know, if I've spent five thousand pounds on a, on a digital campaign and I've got hundred leads, you can do the maths. Yeah. The difference is what you've got to understand is what was the quality of lead. Yeah. From the five on the advert to the hundred on the digital campaign, they could be vastly different. Yeah. So it's not just about generating leads. You've got to analyse how much each one of those costs to obtain. Yeah. Then it's digging down into the quality of them, yeah. Because that you might create yourself a lot of work in the qualifying, yeah. And then you've got to add in the human time to qualify that, and you've got to add that to the campaign cost, yeah. So it gets quite complicated and can get quite in depth. But all the time you've got to get the data. The data won't lie, yeah. If you analyse things properly, record things properly, you will understand how much that lead costs you, what the likelihood is of it turning into business and how many of those particular leads from that channel turn into business because that's the ultimate prize how much did it cost to win that new client yeah not how much it was to generate the lead how many of those leads will it take times five for example to win that client so lead generation in a trying to be more um, succinct is the is the generation of business inquiries or interest into your to your business yeah now, the creation of a sales funnel is what lead generation is. But as Andrew said, where are those leads going to come from? We've got inbound digital leads channels. We've got outbound telemarketing channels. We've got advertising in the press. We've even got referrals. There's endless routes to obtain leads. But the most important thing to remember is that we have to measure the success of each channel and where the leads are actually coming from so that we can really understand what the return of investment is actually gonna be. It's not just about generating leads, it's about analyzing how much each of those leads cost to obtain and how quality that eventual lead will become to our business. We must identify the cost efficiency of each channel in comparison to other channels. How many of those leads would now actually become paying clients? And what is the total cost to actually acquire that lead? What are the mistakes we often make when it comes to lead generation? In the day and age that we live in now, there are various ways to get ourselves and our businesses out there so that we get ourselves known. But does that mean we have to utilize every single avenue available to us. They'll, they won't put a lot of thought into campaigns. They will just buy some advertising, they'll do some digital media, they'll do some, some telemarketing. Do, but it's not part of a, an organised plan. So actually you've got leads flying in from everywhere at different paces, different volumes, and no one manages them. Yeah. And you're not getting back to people quick enough. Or the volume that are coming through are too poor but because you're getting a lot of leads, you think it's working? Yeah. So I think, it, I think the mistakes that people make is they, they think that all leads are good leads. Yeah. Well, you've got to be a little bit stronger and a bit more ruthless with some of your leads sometimes. Yeah. And we all like to get inquiries into our business, but you know very quickly, and experience um, certainly helps, is what, what a good lead looks like and what a bad lead looks like. The secret is, how do you deal with the, the ones that are not quite so good for your business? You don't want to ignore them. You don't want to be rude. So you've got to find a mechanism of how to push that one back politely or actually recommend someone else that, that might be more um, appropriate for that, that company or person. But be helpful, but be efficient in doing it. Yeah. If it's going to take you 20, 30, 40 minutes to qualify out a piece of business, that's very expensive use of my time or yours. Yeah. But so you've got to have the qualification process. Yeah. Needs to be absolutely spot on. And that's where digital media does become really helpful because a lot of that 
qualification process can be on a website yeah. or on a landing page. Yeah. But if you're putting your telephone number on a website, which people still want to ring up, yeah. however, however many contact forms you've got, people still want to phone up and speak to someone. Speak to the person, yep. You've got to make sure that person knows what they're doing when they're, when they're asking the right questions yeah. to qualify that company in or out. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say it's all about getting that process set up. Yeah. Really, really efficiently and smartly to, 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 to qualify leads in and out. Really. Yeah. Now it's a classic case of a jack of all trades, but a master of none. We may have all the leads flying in from different directions, but are these leads even quality leads? What are our plans for those that are not going to do business with us right away? We need to find ways to take these leads through a process where we keep them sweet. We keep them nurtured long enough so that eventually they become and bring return to our business. People think that all leads are good leads. So we must find a mechanism to filter through all the leads that eventually come to us. Now this is called the qualification process as Andrew touched on. We've done it, you've done it. We've brought a product or a service to market and we think it's the best thing since sliced bread. We think that it's gonna change the entire galaxy. But what should a product or service-based business actually do before we start our sales activity? What they really need to do is go back to the five P's of marketing. You know, understand the product, the price, the place, the promotion, and the people. That's how you would market a new product. Yeah. That's a completely different conversation. But you've got to start with those basics. Yeah. But actually, once you've, once you've gone through the five P's and understand who, how, why you're going to sell it, for how much, who the audience is, I think you should go to the understanding the why, which we've talked about. Yeah. And there's a fantastic book, um, Simon um, Sinek, Start With Why. Yeah. Read that book or, or, or find a, you know audio version or edited version of it. It's all about understanding what your product is, your service. Yeah and why it can make a difference, what the purpose of it is. And I think if you go through that, then do the five Ps, you'll understand, it'll probably answer a lot of those questions for you. Yeah. So it's, it's, but you've got to do some testing, you've got to speak to lots of people, you could do focus groups, you could do all sorts. There's so many different ways of research, but actually you've got to understand the why. Yeah. Why, why is this going to be different? And what's the difference? differentiator of this over another alternative, for example. Understanding the why is my biggest sort of tip yeah. on, on that situation. We must focus on the five Ps of marketing. Product, price, place, promotion, and people. Product, we must know our products inside and out. We must know the USP that we're bringing to the table and what the things are that differentiate us from our competitors. Pricing. What do we value our product or service to be? Are we going to come in the market at the high end or the low end? Where are we going to sit price-wise in the market? A strategy that someone once shared with me to determine the price point of any product or service that we've got to offer is once you've got a product or once you've got a service, find some people and give them a free sample. Hopefully those people love or enjoy or actually find useful what you're offering them. Once you've given them some time, go back to that person and ask them, how much would you pay for this product? How much would you pay for this service? At that point, because that person didn't actually pay for the product in the first place, you should be able to get a realistic price point of what that person actually thinks it's worth. That person could even say, it's worth two times initially what you had in mind, or three times, or even half. Now, once you've done this a few times, you should be able to quantify the average price from this experiment that you've done. This way, you can really get what you think your target market thinks your product should be worth. Place. 
where are we going to market our products? Are we thinking local or are we thinking big? Are we thinking global? Promotion. How are we going to promote our product? Are we going to do this ourselves or are we going to outsource the, the marketing and the promotional activities to specialists so that we can focus on actually polishing and making and creating the product or service that we have to bring? People. Who are we selling to and why are we selling to them? After going through these five Ps, it's going to help us to create a more defined strategy when it comes to our sales activity. Now, how does someone know which channel is right for them? For them? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I think if you're launching or inventing or bringing a new product to market, you, you'll, you'll know the reason why you're doing that and why you think it can be special. Yeah. So you'll actually understand how your competitors are doing it. Um, unless you're a you know, super innovative new, new channel. Um, but you'll understand how your competitors are selling it. So they're, they're going to be immediate channels. But in all honesty, I think it goes back to testing. Test and learn. There's, cracky, we could sit here and name 10, 15 channels off the top of your head. You've got to be realistic. You know, are you going to sell a car through a cold call? Probably not. You've, a showroom is still the most likely. However, Tesla don't have um, showrooms particularly. They have, they have a shop, don't they, in a, in a shopping centre, really. So, so what they've done is built their brand. And there's lots of social, social um, exposure around that. So that the brand sell, sells the model, but they've gone in as a, an in, innovation, high tech. So they, they, they've got a certain market that they want to go to. So they will find the channels where the audience are lo most likely to be. Yeah. So I suppose that's the answer to the question is, if you know who your audience is, you understand which channels they're most likely to use yeah. to, get your, to get your products. But you've got to understand that, that, that piece before you can understand the channel. As Andrew said, are you going to sell a car through a cold call? Probably not. If you know what your audience is, you'll understand which channels they're likely to use. It all goes back to testing and learning and seeing what works for us. Once we've identified the things that are working, then it's down to us to put more time and resource into these channels so that we can best optimize them. So what do we do with clients that we've already sold to before? Yeah, I think that. you can nurture, can't you, and, and educate. Um, it's difficult, isn't it? If someone's bought one product mm. and they've got to opt in for a start, you know, because of GDPR for you to start yeah. mar marketing or remarketing to them. Um, so you've got to be sensible about it. I, yeah. I, I don't like it being bombarded with, with spam just because I've bought one product. So That was, that was going to be a question I was going to ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm quite a tough customer, really. Oh, um, no. Grinch. <laughs> especially when it comes to Christmas. Yeah, exactly. Once people have purchased something from us or given exchange of their details in return for something, there's a likelihood that they're likely to buy again in the future or engage with us again in the future. But it's all about taking them on a nurturing journey so that we remain relevant and fresh in their minds. Finally, I asked Andrew what his top tips for effective selling was, and here's what he had to say. Know your product and service inside out before you, before you get, on the, get on the phone. Um, do lots of training, do lots of you know, rehearsals, pitches with colleagues and um, things like that, so you're, you're getting confident. Research your audience so try and steer away from the spray and pray and get laser focused on who you want to target. So less is more in terms of data. The, the less prospects you've got, the more you've got time to understand each of them in more detail and know the reason that you're ringing them and why your product or service should suit them. Do your homework, do your research. We, I mean, in my business, we have researchers, qualifiers, and then closers. A lot of people just 
give it to the cloud to do everything. We don't really want your most expensive resource doing loads of database building or LinkedIn. You, know, you can get other people to do that and, f and create a um, marketing qualified lead, you know, a warm lead, but it still needs, you know, um, someone to call in. But I think this, the simple answer is you've got, this is one of the oldest sales phrases in the industry. You've got two ears and one mouth and you mm -hmm. use them in that order. Ask open questions, get someone to, like you do, as, as if you're interviewing someone. That's exactly how you should treat a sales call, really. Ask the right open questions and let, let someone sit and answer them. Make it relevant, and that, that comes into your targeting. But you don't need to be a really good salesperson if you answer, if you've got two or three key questions that are open questions, use closed ones when you need them, but who, what, where, when, why, how, those kind of open questions in any sales environment will get you the answers that you need to know. And you can sit back whilst they're singing like a canary, as we used to say, and take the notes. Yeah. And then that will guide your next question. But ratios, theoretically, you should be maybe 25% you and 75% the customer. Mm. You're there to find out about them, yeah. not there to tell all about yourself. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, the, that's the mistake a lot of people make when they're calling or they're in a sales pitch. They're so excited, they just get really nervous and they just, they just blur everything else there is to know about their business before they understand really who they're, who they're with. Yeah. It should be the other way around. So number one, know your product or service inside out. Number two, rehearse your pitch and how you present your product or service or idea to people. One thing I would add to that, that I know will help us, is to trial, to test, and to learn. Number one, we're trialing out which channels work for us to generate leads and business for our companies. Once we've noticed the one or two things that are working out well for us, let's test it now. Let's test the best ways to optimize these particular channels so that we can ultimately get the best result from them. We can never stop learning. Even when something is working well, there's more we can learn. There's more we can do to make things more efficient. And definitely when we don't know it all, that's when we need to learn even more. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Grow, where we learned about sales and how best to generate leads for our business. Join me on the next episode. And remember, let's grow together.